quick update. So thank you, and I'll see you at lunch. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Davide. And I'm Neil. Uh, we'll be talking about what the Hypercell SIG has been doing lately. Uh, I've given various versions of this talk over the years, so hopefully this is not too boring if you've been to one of the previous ones. But hey, we have uh, a logo now. We do, we do have a logo, yes. Uh, these are slightly less boring than they usually are. So here's the agenda for today. Uh, we will do a quick recap on what the SIG is. Uh, we will talk about deliverables and what recent work we've been doing, and we'll close uh, with a few notes about what's coming down the pipe. You want to do the intro, Neil? Yeah, sure. So uh, the CentOS Hyperscale SIG is m primarily focused around the CentOS stream. Our goal is to be able to support, uh, to do, enable people to collaborate to bring what they're doing to support large-scale deployments of CentOS throughout uh, to the community and to be able to help everyone kind of benefit from those kinds of things. And key to that is being able to have this community-centric cross-company, cross-stakeholder collaboration on packages and testing because in any real organization that's going to run any kind of Linux at scale, whether it's for desktop servers, cloud, whatever, uh, you're going to make your own packages and you're probably going to be either replacing some stuff or shipping some stuff or updating some stuff or whatever. And in a lot of places, they wind up just doing it internally and then never sharing it with anyone. We want to bring that more into the open and to help people build a good community of practice around this kind of stuff and maybe even upstream some stuff to make it better for all the other people. And open to anybody who's really wanting to do this kind of stuff, whether it's desktop, server, cloud, you know, weird thingamajig here or something. Yeah, we're, we're open to it. Yeah, and to be clear, even if this is primarily targeting large-scale environments, you don't have to work at a company to contribute to the SIG. It's, it is really open to anyone. So if you find this kind of work interesting or if you think what you would like to do would be a good fit for the SIG, by all means, feel free to reach out and get involved. Uh, so the SIG was established in January 2021. Uh, we started with six founding members from various companies. Uh, we've now grown to 30 members. Uh, which has been, has been quite fun. Uh, and to be clear, this isn't necessarily 30 members that are like actively doing things all the time, because uh, people have various interests. Some people will join just to work on a specific thing, and they will keep like working on that. Um, but generally speaking, uh, I would say we have a core group of people that is fairly, that is fairly active, and then there's a wider group of people that kind of, kind of come and go or will join for specific activities. Uh, we hang out on IRC on CentOS Hyperscale. The room is also based on Matrix. You're welcome to join. Uh, at any time. Uh, most of us are in the US, so you might get interactive replies if you hit us up on US time, uh, but people generally keep an eye on the channel. There are formal meetings every two weeks, also on IRC, uh, on the Sandos Meetings channel, uh, which you're also welcome to join if you would like. Uh, and for the last year or so, we've also do, uh, done monthly video hangouts. Uh, this was something that started during the pandemic, and it proved very nice both to actually have some kind of face-to-face -face connection, especially when we couldn't meet each other at conferences. Uh, but it's also useful, and these end up being a mix of social time and like occasionally working through problems or just shit posting. Uh, lots it's fun. Of, lots of that. Uh, it's an open Zoom meeting, so it's, anybody's welcome, is welcome to join. Uh, we've also started doing actual in-person meetups now that we can travel again. Uh, we did our first uh, meetup in Boston uh, at DEF CONF US last year, and we did our second meetup at Connect Earlier, I first them. I wanted to do a meetup at this event, but time uh, we couldn't get it scheduled in time. Uh, but hopefully, we will do another one this year, uh, later in the year, at some point. Somewhere, maybe. Um, we will see. So this is really just you know, you know, more detail about the things that David and I just said. You want to check out? We we try to document all the things that we're doing, and we have a back catalog of talks and things like that as well as our, track, our ticket tracker that shows what kind of stuff we're working on, what we're thinking about, things of that nature. Feel free to check all of them out, lots uh, more detail. We also publish activity reports uh, every three months, I believe, whenever I Sean emails me that I'm due for an activity report. Which he did just uh, before this event We are started. due for another one that will come out after this conference at some point, but you can find the previous ones uh, linked there. They're all published on the Santos blog as well. Uh, okay, let's talk about scope. Uh, generally speaking, uh, the SIG is focused on, as I said, enabling large-scale deployments. Uh, this, this happens on various stages and various layers, but the main things that we try to do is, first of all, faster moving package backwards. So there are sets of packages that we would like to be able to maintain at a faster pace compared to what's in stock CentOS stream. And because these are packages that are part of core CentOS stream, they aren't the kind of thing we could maintain in Appel. So it makes sense to do this kind of work in a SIG. Uh, one example here is systemd that uh, we will talk about in a little bit. Um, the other large 
bucket of changes we maintain in the SIG is policy and configuration alternative and changes. So patches that are shipping the distribution that have opinionated default settings that don't necessarily match what would be a good fit for this kind of environments. So we ship packages that have alternative settings here, but with the idea that they are still dropping compatible with the stock distribution one. They just provide extended, extended abilities and extended opportunities. Um, the SIG is also a good space for doing large scale testing of features. Um, generally speaking, uh, in some cases you're able to test changes just by touching one package, but there are some things that involve the distribution overall. So it is useful to have a place that, where this can be applied and it can be tested in a production environment. And we will have an example of this later as well. Uh, finally, we produce a kernel build as part of the SIG, and we also produce uh, live DVD uh, images. Okay, let's talk about package backports. Uh, package backports are delivered uh, in the hyperscale repo that we maintain uh, on a stock CentOS stream system. You can DNF install CentOS release hyperscale that will give you access to the repo. As I said, these are meant as dropping replacement for stock CentOS packages. So if you're running a stock system and you install this, it should behave the same as your previous stock system. Uh, and if it doesn't, that's a bug and you should let us know. Uh, these, uh, these packages are built against Appel and they require Appel because frankly, a modern system isn't terribly useful without Appel. Uh, we only target x86 and ARM because uh, those are the only architectures we can actually test on. But if somebody is really passionate about, say, Power or S390, you are welcome to join us and maintain them. Uh, there is a long list of packages I am not going to put here because it would be very boring. Uh, but those are the last ones that, from looking at the build tag, came up recently. Uh, in general, these tend to be uh, either packages where the version stream is too old to be useful for a specific use case, so it's a backport from Fedora, or a specific patch that is missing uh, that will take a while to get upstreamed into stream properly, so we we'll maintain it in the SIG until it's updated in stream. And same for the updates, by the way. Oftentimes, these then get up rebased in stream and we can drop them. Um, or it's packages that we follow the upstream very closely and want to maintain them. Two major items that we are working on lately are OpenSSH and Kimu. Uh, OpenSSH is driven primarily by Meta, uh, where we have an internal build on OpenSSH with a fairly extensive patch set that we'd be slowly working with the OpenSSH upstream community to get open sourced and ideally merged into OpenSSH proper. Um, so we are, we're gonna try and get this maintained as part of Hyperscale. There are builds of these already out, but they are not in the repo because frankly, I don't trust them to be usable. Oh. Uh, but if you want to play with them, the sources are out there and the patch set is there. Um, likewise for Kimu, uh, we have a few members in the SIG that are interested in having an up-to-date Kimu. Uh, ideally an up-to-date Kimu in Appel, because Kimu would actually be a good fit for Appel, um, but also uh, I think there's room for doing SIG work here. Uh, so we're hopeful that we'll be able to provide Kimu and potentially an extended virtualization stack as part of the SIG uh, in the future. Right, so as part of what we do, we try to make sure that uh, whatever packages we're either backporting, modifying, forking, whatever, that we can keep track of what's going on. So if you're involved in Fedora, you're probably familiar with release monitoring and the automated uh, notifications for when new versions of software is out. So we implemented a variation of this that actually takes two feeds. It takes release monitoring for upstream stuff, but it also takes um, uh, information from uh, CentOS Stream Core to see whether, you know, when stuff gets updated there so that if we have a package that is actually forked from CentOS Stream, we can do rebases and stuff like that as well as being able to track the things that we use, we track from mainline from Fedora, for example, like as we're going to mention later with Systemd where we track further along, we can make sure that we are caught up with that and keeping up to date. Um, we don't yet do the rebuild stuff, that's something that we're kind of trying to figure out how to do. It's a complicated mess of interactions with all the infrastructure to do it properly. But it's a goal that we want to have because we want to reduce, because like if uh, with the package set that we have and a bunch of different things, a lot of it is very mechanical uh, after we get the initial package made and so we'd like to be able to reduce the busy work and make it easier for us to do more high value stuff. Yeah, and uh, if, you, if you're in a SIG that maintains packages, you can run the same tooling if you would like. Uh, it's, it's published on that repo. It's relatively straightforward to deploy on OpenShift. Yeah. Um, or really any other deploying environment where you can deploy containers. Uh, so let's talk about systemd. As I mentioned, we have a branch uh, of systemd that we track uh, as part of hyperscale. We currently, the release version currently is 2.5.2. Um, we were, uh, I think we had 2.5.3 in progress, but we'll probably just do 2.5.4 at this point because that just came out upstream. We have builds for stream eight and stream nine. Uh, this is, uh, this generally, tracks the latest-ish systemd, and it's built with the defaults of the latest-ish systemd in Fedora. Uh, among other things, this means that it ships with Cgroup2 by default, um, 
And I, I expect at some point you will actually drop support for Secret One uh, when that ends up happening upstream in System D. It also ships with uh, the, a plethora of extensive demons that System D provides that aren't shipped in CentOS Stream by default. So it ships with UMD, uh, it ships with Network D, we resolve D. Um, UMD, on, if you're running the stock kernel from Stream, you will need to run it with PSI, uh, which I believe is not enabled by default in 8, and you have to boot with PSI equal 1 or something like that. I think we have PSI 9 enabled in by In 9 default. installed there, and UMD is actually provided in CentOS Stream Core now for 9 as well. It's just yeah. not installed by default. Yeah. But, um, and I don't think we have the weights in the, yeah, in the stock one. We do have the weights now? Yeah, they, they oh, have nice. the weights. You, we added that upstream. Excellent. So only Network D and, uh, and Resolve D is also upstream, also turned off by default. But Network D is a specific one we add on top, and then there's a bunch of stuff from Meta and the system community backported down into uh, to make it better for our use cases. Yeah, to for uh, we also so an example recently was the journal stuff, for example, where there was a lot of work coming from Meta, where folks were working on improving the journal upstream, and these were changes that we were able to test in production by leveraging the SIG, and then we were able to get them landed into system D upstream, and then they became available as release builds. Uh, this build also supports SE Linux. Um, although, uh, as far as I know, none of us actually run SE Linux in production that are running this environment. Yes, well, you do, that's right. <laughs> um, if you're passionate about SE Linux, uh, we could really use more people to keep an eye on the SE Linux stuff here, because it, it's hard. Um, but generally, these are just backports of the SE Linux policy onto, um, from, Fedora. from Fedora in a module, uh, just to make it work. Uh, and if you're interested about uh, features in system D specifically, you can reference just the news file from upstream, which is very comprehensive. Um, the way we actually do is that we have a repo on Pegure that tracks the actual system D upstream repo that we use to stage patches. That's the one that we make releases from. This usually tracks system D stable, not, oh, sorry, not system D. Um, we uh, then have another repository for Relinge uh, that we, we used to have this on Pegure, but we moved it to GitLab so we could leverage the GitLab pipelines CI. Uh, this has both scripts that developers use to do the general work, but it's also where the CI is maintained. Uh, the way the CI works is that we do daily uh, rebuilds of, uh, of our packages against the latest systemd git head. So the idea is that every day we get signal on whether, is there, has there been any change in systemd upstream that would break on stream in our environment so we can, so we can do something about it. Uh, sometimes it's a bug on our side, sometimes it's something that needs to be fixed in systemd, sometimes a little bit of both. This has been very useful at Meta internally specifically. Oh, I work for Meta, by the way, <laughs> in case it wasn't clear. Uh, but it's also useful in general. Neil does not work for Meta. Uh, Neil works for Reddit. Um, uh, but this has been useful in general. Uh, long term, we would actually like to have a bit more of extensive testing here, so we could do things like, say, spin up a VM or a cloud instance and run a battery of tests, potentially run the test suite. Uh, we're not quite there yet. Uh, the how to work with system D is documented fairly well, so you can reference the contributor's guide if you're interested in doing work there. All right, you wanna do this one? Yeah, sure. Right, so some time ago, some lovely folks from Intel came by and said, hey, we wanna do, uh, we wanna try to do cool things with our CPUs, and there's nowhere to do it. Yeah, we were okay with doing it, let's, let's go for it. And so we worked with Intel to create um, a space for them that included, um, you know, things like a Zlib backport with some enhancements that they've been working on, um, some glibc stuff. They're ABI and API compatible. Um, last I heard actually that some of that's gonna move to the ISA SIG, and some of that is going to move into CentOS Stream Core finally, and some of that's going to be completely thrown out and replaced with a Fedora change at some point because um, there are some, uh, there are some things that are targeted that we could go into Fedora to then bring into the next rel or something like that. So there's, there's some stuff going on there, but yeah. Yeah, you can reference the blog post for more information. This is a, actually a pretty good example, I think, of the kind of change that can be staged in the SIG and then can provide a place to prove that it's actually useful and valuable and then it can get upstream in all, in all the proper places. And long term, we can sunset the changes in the SIG itself. It's also one of those examples of where something can start out in our SIG and then fork out into their own SIG if it makes sense and they have uh, some kind of sustaining energy for yep. it. So. Um, oh yeah, as I mentioned, we target eight and nine concurrently. Uh, most of the new development, I would say, happens on nine and then is backported on eight. Um, I think most of our production environments these days are on nine. I expect at some point we will sunset, well, we will definitely sunset eight by the EOL, um, but I expect as we get closer to the EOL, work that goes on eight will start dwindling quite a bit. Uh, as part of the SIG, we actually did quite a few contributions to Stream itself. I'm not gonna read off all of these, and this is not a comprehensive list. 
Uh, but these are some examples of things that we worked on in stream itself. This generally led to either contributions on GitLab to CentOS stream proper or working with the developers in stream to land the corresponding change in the distribution. Uh, and I did not list all of their e-bases because that would be far That would too, be a very long it's list. It's far too boring. Um, on the testing side, as I mentioned before, uh, the SIG also provides an avenue for doing large scale testing. So the example we have here is the copy and write change we've been working for quite a few years now. And the idea behind this change that you can read all of it on the Fedora Wiki is that it's that change to the packaging stack, so RPM, DNF, and that ecosystem to leverage ButterFS and leverage copy on write in a way that can make package installs more efficient. And this isn't just patching RPM, it is a fairly extensive change that involves multiple components. So it's kind of difficult to test by just installing a few packages. Um, so what we did in the SIG is that we provide a repo called Experimental that has all of the packages needed for this change uh, that you can, you can install the release package there and then do DNF upgrade and that will give you the whole stack and it will let you leverage this feature. This is what we run in production at Meta, by the way, because we, we actually run this stuff and it works fairly well. Uh, but it both provides a way for people to play with it and test it. And it's also a nice, it's a nice playing ground uh, that allows the change to evolve. And uh, there's been quite a lot of discussion upstream in RPM on the best way to integrate this change. And it has, the form of it has changed quite a bit. And I, I've linked the various MRs because I, uh, the various PRs, so I think it's a fairly interesting thing to look at if, um, if you're interested in the history of the change. Uh, but having it out there made it very easy to find people to, here's a, it's a place where this actually works that you can test, that you can play with. Yeah, and so for the kernel, uh, we, on, on top of the stuff that we're doing with the user space stuff, I, uh, a, in the SIG, actually make a, a kernel that enables other features. Primarily we do, um, right now I think a simple DRM enabled across the board to, for basic graphics, and we have ButterFS support. Um, we build for CentOS Stream 9 and 8 uh, based on the CentOS Stream 9 kernel tree, and it's available in the experimental repo, and it's really like a complement to the other stuff that we're doing um, in the user space. And as part of doing this particular work, uh, we actually did a bunch of contribution work to CentOS Stream 9 upstream, and I wound up being the guinea pig for figuring out how the hell to handle upstream contributions in the CentOS Stream 9 kernel. Um, as, and, and part of that I chronicled my experiences and kind of wrote for our SIG um, a cheat sheet of like how to correctly contribute fixes to the CentOS Stream 9 kernel. Um, and in addition to that work, um, the SIG helps uh, with KMOD ButterFS for the KMOD SIG um, to make sure that it stays working and that they can ship it for, for REL as a separate kernel module. Uh, this is a oh, I can do this one. On the user space side, uh, there's a few changes that um, take care of the user space side for ButterFS. So we have a backward of ButterFS progs, because uh, StockRail stock doesn't ship ButterFS, so they don't ship the user space for it either, so CentOS Stream doesn't either. So we ship ButterFS progs and we ship com sites. We also ship uh, the storage stack and installer in the distribution where ButterFS support is restored, so this can be used uh, for building, building Anaconda effectively and building images with ButterFS. We also ship other kernel user space, uh, so has install, for example, uh, there's a few other things, I think, um, in, in the same no vein. That list is not <laughs> comprehensive. Uh, finally, uh, we ship a modified build of kpatch. Uh, kpatch is shipped in, in the distribution, uh, but uh, the version that is shipped in RHEL and in CentOS Stream doesn't include the actually useful bit of kpatch, which is the part of making kernel patches, because uh, I believe it's meant for you get kernel patches from Red Hat and you can apply them. Uh, we ship kpatch with the build side, so you can make your own kernel patches if you want, and we also ship support for Clang PGO optimization, which is something that Meta has been working on for the past couple of years, because um, uh, we, we use Clang extensively for kernel builds internally. Uh, I am not gonna talk about PGO, because it's a complicated topic, but if you're interested in this, there was a, a long talk at Plumbers uh, last year, I believe, yep. that covered this, um, so you might find that interesting. Um, we, in addition to packages, we also have container images. Container images are great, because they give you a way to quickly play and test the system. Uh, these are built from scratch uh, on OpenShift. Uh, you can find the repo there. These aren't based on existing uh, string container images. They are bare images built from nothing. Uh, the reason for this is because the, the center string container images were originally based on UBI and that made it very complicated to layer our changes on top. Uh, these are hosted on Quay and you can use them with that Palman one-liner if you wanna play with it. Um, these are minimal container images, so they're, they're fairly suitable for doing work on top if you would like to do so. I like using them for CICD stuff because Apple's also pre-enabled and activated in it. Yep. 
So on top of this, like uh, with with the container stuff, as long and along with the kernel and the RPM cow, that kind of builds up to the live media spins that we've been working on. Um, so currently we have two CentOS Stream 8 spins, the GNOME and KDE Plasma, that were built with kickstarts using live CD tools. Um, these include basically their whole suite of stuff except for the Intel repo uh, and allows us to give people a complete experience of what our entire stack looks like and how it performs. Um, you can download it and check it out. We've been, for the past, what, year and a half or so, been plugging away at getting CentOS Stream 9 stuff done. Um, using Kiwi, using Kiwi descriptions, getting a whole bunch of um, infrastructural work done to support it within CBS because for CentOS Stream 8, I was doing it on my laptop and I was uploading everything by hand and it sucked and it was very manual and sometimes I screwed up and that was not good. So for CentOS Stream 9, we're trying to automate and support, simplify the process so anyone can do this anywhere. And because of the work that we're doing for this, we actually collab, we, we helped uh, essentially spin up the alternative image SIG, and we've been using our expertise to help them get started to start providing images as well. Yeah, the idea is for eventually all of the image building work to converge within the alt images SIG, so that that becomes kind of a service that is available for other SIGs that would like to build images, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time. Uh, coming up in the future, uh, as I mentioned, there is more work to do around image builds. Uh, there's the work we talked about, Kimu. Uh, we have a long-standing goal of uh, putting together a way to do transactional updates using ButterFS. Um, and we would also like to have cloud images at some point for hyperscale. Uh, these are both things that we would like to have in the future but aren't quite there yet. Uh, here's a few links uh, that you can reference. Uh, I will upload these and attach them to SCAD so you can get a copy of the slides afterwards so you don't have to remember this. And that's all we had. Do we have time for questions? Two okay, are there any questions? Spishek. So this is not a question for Neo, it's a question for you. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that you contribute stuff to, to, to stream and there's this issue that uh, was even mentioned today during the, the, the keynote that Red Hat only wants stuff that is useful for RHEL. Uh, does this create a problem in practice for you? Yes. Uh, this has been a long-standing source of tension, I would say. Uh, the, I think in general things are trending in the right direction and are getting better, but I think there's a lot of variance depending on who maintains specific components within stream and within RHEL on whether your contribution will be accepted or will be timely reviewed or not. So there's, there's areas of the distribution where it's very easy to get changes, where it's very easy to have a conversation on, hey, this component should really be rebased, and, and we can get that done quickly. There's other areas where this can take a while, it can take several conversations, it can take getting somebody offline on a meeting to, to actually discuss it, and sometimes it's just not a good fit. And sometimes you do end up having to do this downstream because for whatever reason, it, it just doesn't work well. Um, so I, I think that's something that we are trying to figure out overall. Uh, I would say that compared to trying to do this back in the day when we were with CentOS 7, CentOS Linux 7, uh, this is far better than it ever used to be. And just the fact of having, the, having everything in the GitLab repo where you can submit MRs directly there, you don't have to rely on like attaching patches to Bugzilla and hoping for somebody to see them. That's already been a big improvement. But, but yes, I, I agree that this is something that we generally, we overall need to do better at. Any other questions? Thank you.